Okay. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Suchi Saria. Um, she's a John C. Malone assistant professor at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, her research focuses on Bayesian probabilistic modeling for complex real world systems. Um, her main research focus is on the intersection of machine learning and healthcare to uh, develop new classes of diagnostic and treatment planning tools. She's won numerous awards and accolades, including uh, most recently a Sloan Fellowship this year. And uh, the last time I saw her speak was about two years ago at TEDx Boston, and she gave a, a really wonderful talk on um, machine learning for early uh, diagnosis of um, sepsis or early detection of sepsis. So I'm really excited to see what she's been up to lately. And so uh, can we all please welcome Suchi. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm so thrilled to see all of you. I, I'm always afraid of making 9 a.m. talks, so I'm impressed that so many of you are here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, on new ways in which we, we can use machine intelligence to augment clinical intelligence. So healthcare and medicine are growing, going through a massive transformation. So for those of you who are sort of new to it or just re know a little bit about it from reading the New York Times, one of the interesting things that have happened um, in this industry is that a lot of past innovations relied on novel innovations in drugs and devices. And the big change that's happening now is that more and more data are becoming available, and this data is making it possible for novel types of um, interventions that are more data-driven and software-based to come in and uh, improve quality of care and um, reduce cost. So this specific change started to happen in about um, 19, let's see, 2008, 2008-2009, when um, essentially there were a couple of milestone policy-related um, events happened. The first one was the passage of what's called the High Tech Act. And what that act did was incentivize large health systems by paying them money or charging them penalties to be, uh, if they did not digitize the data that they were uh, collecting during a doctor-patient encounter. So if you've ever been to a hospital or if you've ever been to a patient clinic, essentially when you go in, you walk in the door, you know, they do things like they take some tests and they record your symptoms, they ask you why are you here, they try to make a diagnosis of what's happening, and then they make prescriptions of what to do next. And all of that data used to sit in paper records. And what that meant was, um, there was no easy way to go retrospectively, look back at that data to understand if the right treatments were prescribed or if we could have done things differently and better. Is there ways to stitch records across multiple visits and multiple individuals like this individual to think through how we could have, um, you know, intervened differently? So the High Tech Act that happened in 2008 uh, 2009, and then the Affordable Care Act that happened in 2010, where effectively um, Center for Medicare and Medicaid, which, or, uh, which administers a lot of uh, the government-focused healthcare in this country, um, it started providing more and more incentives, financial incentives, for starting to use this data in intelligent ways to uh, reduce cost of care, improve quality. And that meant suddenly we have these very diverse types of data sets that are now becoming available, all the way from granular physiologic data and monitors to the right. Um, let's see, can you, you can see my, so all the way to data that's happening here in monitors to, as we go anti-clockwise, lab tests, medications, procedures, imaging data, notes, now some places are collecting genomic data in mass, data from sensors, and billing data. So today I'm going to talk about two examples. I put together two examples for novel ways in which machine learning can be used for redefining how we deliver care in two different areas. 
The first one is a story of a, um, a patient with Parkinson's. So Parkinson's is the second largest neurodegenerative disorder. It has a huge impact on our health system. It costs $25 billion annually in the U.S. alone. The challenge with Parkinson's is it's one of those diseases that doesn't have a cure and unfortunately you have to live with it. And the um, focus of treatment is all around reducing progression and managing symptoms. And these symptoms, as you go through later stages of Parkinson's, can be quite invasive. So you have things like tremor, rigidity, difficulty walking, loss of balance, falls, and then later stages, you also experience non-motor symptoms like depression, lack of sociability, inability to move, you're homebound, bed bedridden, and that affects your quality of life tremendously. So let's look through what does it mean to, so what is sort of a cartoon version of what a provider or a neurologist is trying to do when they're looking to treat Parkinson's? So what I'm showing you here in this figure is in the gray is this region. So this is time on the x-axis. And in gray is the region where over time your symptoms over the course of a day fluctuate. Okay? It's a lot like diabetes if you're familiar with changes in glucose levels in the body. Similarly, in Parkinson's, your reactions or your symptoms are a response to the dopamine levels in your brain. Okay? And, in the, and if you have low dopamine levels, you experience high levels of symptom. And, in the, and that's what we, in this figure is depicted by the gray region. So in the gray region, effectively, you're in what's called the off state. So off state is when you're experiencing symptoms and you have loss of movement, rigidity, stability, loss of balance, and so on and so forth. Now, once you give medication to this patient, uh, medications tend to be uh, influence uh, the symptoms within a short period of time, six to eight hours in the early stages of Parkinson's, which means the patient's symptom level follows that arc. So it slowly improves as the medication starts to take effect, and they go in the green regions, and the green region is the good region. So you want them to be in the green region for as much of the day as possible. Now, they go in the green region. Over time, the medication starts to wear off, and that's when you go down the downward arc back into the gray zone, right? So essentially, over the course of a day, there's this nature of ups and downs that happen in the life of a Parkinson's patient where you start with high levels of symptoms, you take a medication, you start to feel better for some period of time. As medications wear off, you go back into your gray state, you take medications again, and you do that again, okay? Okay. Now, if you take too much medications, you go in the red region, which is called dyskinesia. Here, you have uh, uncontrollable movement. So instead of lack of movement, you have too much movement. And these are uncontrollable movements, so that's bad as well. So you really want to kind of manage medications in a way that you're between the gray and red in the green zone. And now the other thing that's hard about it is that as patients progress, this loop of how you react to medication varies over time. So early stages of Parkinson's, more predictably responsive, you have longer response times. Later stages of Parkinson's, your response, you go shoot up and are responsive much faster. And unfortunately, it's much easier to take you to the dyskinesia zone, which means um, managing your dose carefully is a lot harder. Okay. The other thing that's challenging about it is that this progression pattern varies across day, day to day, within a day sometimes, and definitely across patients. So if you're looking at this control problem where you're trying to figure out what should the right dose level be and how should I manage this patient, the challenge is if you don't have access to this level of detailed symptomology, it's hard to know how much to dose. So this is going to sound crazy, but right now, the way they measure Parkinson's, because like in diabetes, it's possible to build a glucose meter that measures blood levels, uh, glucose levels in the blood very easily. Unfortunately, in Parkinson's, because it's all about measuring dopamine levels in the brain, it's hard to puncture the brain and measure that. So instead, the way it's currently measured is through this qualitative 30-minute response that neurologists take. So effectively, there's a multi-point test. And these tests are things like, 
can I have you finger tap? And I'm going to watch you finger tap. And based on how you're finger tapping, I'm going to observe whether your symptoms look mild or moderate or severe. And the challenge of this is obviously multifold. So first of all, you can only conduct these tests when you come to the clinic. That means once every three months at best. Second, when you're coming in, different neurologists may give you different scores or different ratings because it's subjective in nature. Third, that when they come to the clinic, um, patients tend to be stressed which means you're not really getting a measurement of what their health feels like in their natural state. So the big issue here is this idea that we don't have easy ways to even collect the right set of measurements that we would need in order to make the decisions we want to make. So that brings us to the challenge. So two, we started this project nearly three and a half, four years ago, and the question, as I learned more uh, about this uh, sort of the disease, was to was we were wondering, well, how, are there ways in which we can op objectively quantify PD symptoms, uh, both inside the clinic, but more importantly, outside the clinic? And at the time, this is back in 2012, 2013, even is still sort of mostly the case, a lot of the existing work were small studies done in labs where patients were coming into the lab or clinic, and they were instrumenting them with tons of sensors. So they used to be called a Christmas tree of sensors. And the idea, the issue with that is patients don't want to go home and wear these Christmas tree of center, uh, sensors. So you have very low compliance rates and the data you're collecting are not very reliable. Um, and a second issue with it is more that even if you had the data, the ability to learn things from this data was not easy. So I'll dive into that more. So we started asking the question in the following way. Well, since a lot of Parkinson's is about motor symptoms and movement-related symptoms and cognitive response levels and, um, and sociability generally, can we use sensors that are available on a smartphone in order to devise what are called active and passive tests? So active tests are very quick, 30-second things they do on a phone. They get reminders to do it. They do it, uh, you know, it's things like, they're asked to pick up the phone and say, ah, and they're asked to pick up the phone and walk, hold the phone in a particular way and walk for like 10, 20 seconds. And so we have these sh uh, short capsules of tests we ask them to do. Um, these are called active tests. In the background, we use other sensors to be able to monitor movement and position. Again, this is back in 2013, pre-Apple Research Kit days. So we designed this thing and we wondered, well, can we design such a thing? Can we release it? Would patients use it? And so we did that um, and started, um, and through the Parkinson's Voice Initiative, released this app on the Android. Hundreds of patients downloaded it just through word of mouth. And we very soon after had one of the largest, I think the largest longitudinal data set to date in Parkinson's at the time. So what we have now is patients using the phone to collect a whole bunch of measurements or signals, right? So they're collecting the balance, they're doing the balance test, the gait test, voice test, and so on. All we have from that is you know, signals, right? There's still this notion of, well, how do we tie this to anything that's clinically meaningful? We still don't have a way of doing that. So this goes to the second challenge that almost all mobile health applications currently face, which is when we go and record data on a phone, the issue is, in order to turn it into anything clinically meaningful, we need real supervised data. The challenge with collecting supervised data at home is that in this case, for example, you're asking a neurologist who's both incredibly expensive, mostly inaccessible, to go home or find a way to go make these measurements at home multiple times a day or multiple times over the course of a patient's progression uh, and to rate it. Um, so not only one is that expensive, that's hard to do, and three, moreover, their, uh, their uh, ratings themselves are subjective, so it's not necessarily uh, the right gold standard you want to uncover. So here we're going to use a second trick, and here's the trick we developed. So essentially the idea was, well, we can't get physicians to give us actual uh, severity ratings, but what we can collect very cheaply, in fact, in this case for free, is this notion of what's called comparison pairs. So what are comparison pairs? Uh, 
Effectively, there are pairs of times where we can collect ranked severity ordering, right? So for example, in Parkinson's, they often take this test early in the morning before they take the medications. Then they take the medications and they often take the test right after they've taken the medications or soon after. What this means is because they've, in that example, we have an, a comparison pair where we know the severity before taking the medication is going to be higher than the severity after the medication, right? So it's essentially supervised data we got for free. And so we collected a whole bunch of, um, and you can see this in the videos here. So on the left side, you can see the person before taking the medication is having tremendous trouble walking versus on the right, as soon as they've taken the medication, they're completely free and responsive to medication and moving around. And so by taking such example pairs, we can now start to learn from this kind of constraint rank data. So it's pretty straightforward how to do that, so, um, but I'll give you a high level idea. So we're gonna learn a function that maps measurements to severity. So your measurements here are xt. Um, so your measurements here are xt, and g is the function you're trying to learn, which is going to map xt, which is all of the input data, into a score, which is a scalar, st. And in order to do that, to learn this mapping function g, you're going to use as inputs um, ranked pairs. So we want a score that is concordant with experts' ranking of severity. So if you had multiple such pairs and experts rank them a particular way, we want the resulting score to be concordant with those rankings. The second is you may have other constraints. So in this case, for instance, if their pairs take a nearby, we know disease progression, if they've not taken medications, is smooth, so we have additional constraints that come from smoothness. If you know a lot about your cohort in a, uh, in a different disease domain that may have other such constraints, you can incorporate that into learning a constraint-based score. So in this case, we're gonna use a max margin formulation. I'll sort of very quickly run through this. Um, uh, so we use a max margin formulation, where the idea is you have a uh, ranked pair that's given to you, P and Q, XIP and XI, XJQ are the uh, vectors at times P and Q, and TIP and TJQ are the times at which these pairs were collected. And essentially, we want the difference in severity score to be greater than a margin. This margin should be uh, greater than zero. Um, and similarly, we want the differences between consecutive pairs that are nearby to be small. So one can easily now uh, relax this to construct an objective where instead of treating it as hard constraints, you're gonna add a, a soft penalty where every time a constraint is violated, you're seeking a penalty and the penalty is uh, proportional to the, um, the degree of violation. In order to optimize this, you can use very similar tricks. Uh, it's very, it's, you, we use the newton raphson method if you want to learn instead of a linear score, a nonlinear score, you can swap out the G here in this particular derivation. I use the inner product of W dot X, much like we use in the rank SVM. You can replace the W dot G with the kernel trick, or you can effectively uh, use other uh, modern um, nonlinear function approximators. And what that now gives you is the ability to take your X's, learn the G's from offline data, and come up with a score. So now it's essentially taking this cell phone data that was collected and generating a resulting score any time the test is taken. Make sense? So we did that. We, had, we still had no idea if this is really gonna work in practice. So this is uh, some results on clinically now prospectively validating this. And this is result, these are uh, results that were published in JAMA Neurology, which is the uh, top impact factor journal in, uh, for neurology. And the uh, highlight, a quick highlight of the results. So first thing we did was, after we learned such a score, we prospectively recruited a cohort. And in this cohort, we had um, patients come back to the clinic where um, Ray Dorsey and his team of clinicians measured uh, using standard clinical instruments. And there were four instruments that they typically tend to use. It's called the MDS-UPDRS, that's the 30-minute test. There's another one called Timed Up and Go Assessment, and the third one called Hone and Yar Stage. And so what we did was we had Ray recruit patients when they came to the clinic. When the patients came to the clinic, they conducted each one of these tests. They measured what the test value was, 
At the same time, patients took the same test using the phone. We computed the score. The phone automatically computes the score. For lack of a better name, we called it the Mobile Parkinson's Disease Severity Score, or MPDS. And now we compare the MPDS to the standard clinical instrument. So what to, uh, the main thing to get from this table is the fact that on the first uh, column, what you see is the correlation of uh, all of the, of the measurements taken using MPDS and all of the existing instruments. And um, the correlations that we found were both very high and uh, compared to, comparable to what correlations would have been found between pairs of other clinical instruments that are well-established. So all that tells us is basically when UPDRS seems to think a patient is a highly severe, MPDS thinks similarly. When UPDRS thinks the patient is not very sick, MPDS thinks very, uh, in a very similar way. But the question was, if all we were doing was replicating it, that wouldn't be all that exciting. So now we're going forward, and now in this example figure, what I'm showing you is a patient over a seven-month period where they were using this app, and they took this test multiple times a day. Each time they took it, they got a dot. And in this case, we've colored the dots. And the dots are colored by yellow if it's before medication and green if it's after medication. And there are several interesting things to glean from here. So the first thing is that the measurements over a long period of time behave the way we expect, which is it captures this notion from continuing down the line of uh, clinical validity it follows this intuition that before medications, your severity level would have been high, and after medications, your severity level drops. So that's one thing that's exciting. The second is that um, over the course of time, um, you can kind of get a sense for not just sort of day-to-day -day fluctuations, you also get a sense for general gestalt, right? How is it progressing over the course of day. Now, you can imagine with this much variability, if all you had access to were three measurements at three random times over a six-month period, it would be really hard to actually assess if the patient was actually improving or not. So this gives rise to the second plot, which is on this patient, for instance, we overlay the specific UPDRS measurements that were made at three different times when they visited the clinic versus the corresponding MPDS measurements. And the interesting thing to get out of here is, um, you know, while um, like many, many trials in Parkinson's are uh, at the moment reliant on measurements like the UPDRS, and they're doing measurements at three months, six months, 12 months, and if there's so much noise in the degree of measurements that are being made, the challenge is you don't have very much signal as to the, is the drug actually being effective or not, which basically means a ton of drugs never make it to market. In fact, in many neurodegenerative disorders, one of the bigger issues has been that very, very few uh, drugs have made it past uh, phase two trials. They often fail in phase three trials. So when we got this done, this was the first time ever to date that we had um, that anyone had ever measured Parkinson's severity in such a fine way over, an, uh, over a long period of time. Uh, and what this now allows is a brand new way by which we could use such approaches in order to be able to start measuring progression and tying therapies to it. Uh, along the way, as we did the study, Apple decided to start um, go into healthcare and start this thing called Research Kit. So, one of the first four apps that Apple did in Research Kit was one in Parkinson's, where they collaborated with our team to take the one we'd done for the Android uh, and make it available for uh, the Apple uh, iPhone. And now that's turned into a very large study with many, many more uh, individuals enrolled. Uh, furthermore, the FDA is now looking to start incorporating more of these real world they call it real world biomarkers, in order to start measuring progression. And Roche, which is a pharmaceutical company, is already incorporating uh, these types of simplistic biomarkers um, in their trials. And we're looking to now take something like this and expand it to a larger cohort. All of the data, all of the, sorry, all of the code, including the app, the feature generation, the machine learning code, is freely available online for anyone who wants to use it for a different disease area or for someone who's interested in Parkinson's and wants to build a cohort with it.
So takeaways from this first part of the talk. So what I just described was an example by which we used machine learning tricks to augment current clinical capability. They, you know, it's not about just automation, it's augmentation. We are able to now make measurements that were previously never possible and get a new lens into this disease that neurologists didn't previously have. A big challenge there was that, um, you know, traditionally in medicine we've been used to data that are collected in labs very carefully. What uh, machine learning is making possible is the ability to take very noisy sensor streams that otherwise would have mostly gotten discarded and extracting information from it. In order to be effective in doing something like this, one of the big shifts that had to be made was, you know, a lot of our studies, we can, you know, download data on the web, somebody tells you what the data set is, they give you the annotations, they give you the metrics, and bulk of your time is spent effectively optimizing your uh, model architecture in order to be able to train your model. In this particular case, in order to come up with innovations like this, it was, you know, we had to understand the domain well enough to understand what is and isn't possible, what we could measure, how we could learn from the data in order to be able to come up with a new way to um, change the measurement for Parkinson's. And then finally, I described two cute, two cute tricks that are very generally applicable to studies that are um, trying to do in-home monitoring. The first is taking advantage of readily available sensors on a phone, uh, and we sort of exploited the phone sensors in several interesting ways. Um, now people are starting to develop other variables. For instance, Dina Katabi has a beautiful sensor that sits on a wall that uses radio waves to start measuring similar types of things. So I think this area is very exciting and it's gonna grow. The second is this notion of rather than relying on supervised learning, using semi-supervised learning to learn cheaply. And this was really a fundamental bottleneck in being able to really draw reliable inferences from this kind of data. And you know, this is um, exciting to be able to come up with something that we could prospectively validate and show promise. Okay, with that I'll shift gears and talk about a second story. And so the second application is around this idea of forecasting for early diagnosis and prevention. So what do we mean by early diagnosis and prevention? So a lot of current practice of healthcare and medicine is around diagnostic guidelines that are made based on signs and symptoms that physicians can recognize by eye. So effectively, these guidelines are, you know, when A happens and B happens and C happens and D happens, then this person indeed is... Uh, likely suffering from this, and when that happens, then here are some indications to consider, in other words, treatments to consider. The shift towards more data, what that's leading to is this idea of early diagnosis. In other words, rather than recognizing them when they have the symptoms, is there a way we can use data to push the timing at which we recognize the diagnosis to an earlier time? And moreover, if we can, then sometimes it might open up opportunities for us not just to recognize it, but prevent it. And this notion of how early can we recognize it and what can we do to prevent it is a completely wide open field. So let me pick one very simple example of it. So this notion of what's called mortality risk prediction. So a patient comes inside the hospital, they're admitted, they're coming in from some primary condition. Any number of reasons, they get either the condition exacerbates or uh, they contracted an infection while they were in the hospital or there was a medical error. Any number of such reasons, some fraction of these patients die in the hospital and they're not always because of the reason they came to the hospital with. So the question that uh, is now becoming possible to ask is, is there a way in which we can use patient data. So in the bottom, what I'm showing you are measurements like heart rate and respiratory rate and uh, GCS, which is a cognitive measure, but they collect hundreds of such measurements. And these measurements are collected, you know, the patient walks into the emergency department, they run a few tests. If they feel the person's not doing so well, they get them inside the, they admit them to a bed. Over time, more and more measurements are done. You get these sparse and irregular time series data from, uh, you know, of very many different, if you will, sensors that are being, sensory data that are being collected on them. And the question then one might ask is, 
can I look at this kind of data in order to be able to forecast risk of who's likely to be high risk for death so that one could come in and do something to prevent it? And this is an application, for instance, there was a recent paper by uh, Google Brain that generated a lot of excitement on the web uh, for it, but there are over 2,000 papers on this topic in the last few years alone, and there's been a lot of excitement around it. And so one way to think about this problem is you basically are taking what I call these windows of time. So in red, I've marked for each of these sensors this window, and you're taking the window and you're treating it as a classification problem or supervised learning task. So an example implementation might be in the first 24 hours, let's look through all the data that's collected and then predict is the patient is at risk of dying in the next seven days or 24 days or 30 days, okay? So that's the task. So first 24 hours, we want to collect data. Based on this data, we'll forecast are they at risk for dying within a week or 30 days. And so the issue is, so natural way to do this is you collect people, individuals with and without, like you could collect cases and controls or positive and negative uh, labels, patients who died versus patients who didn't, put that into your favorite supervised learning, uh, um, uh, use your favorite supervised learning model to be able to learn a risk assessment score. And the main takeaway I want you to uh, walk away with here is that in doing so, while this is super tempting and an approach that many take, the resulting estimates are unreliable and uh, can lead to patient harm. So let me give you an example of why. So let's say I take this patient, and the question I'm asking is, is this patient at risk? And in the top is this individual, and it's their data. Now, if I train a model using two different data sets, data set A and data set B, and turns out data set A is from hospital A, data set B is from hospital B, they're capturing the same populations, um, same types of features, um, you haven't overfitted, you can still result in the situation where depending on the idiosyncrasies of the data you trained on, you can get completely contradictory answers for whether you think the patient's high risk or not. So as a physician who's using such a tool, this is really problematic. You trained your model in whatever data you trained on, and now you're telling me that if I run it on model uh, using trained on data set A, it gives me high risk, but model trained on data set B, it gives me low risk, when really risk should be much more about what this patient's uh, risk profile looks like based on their innate measurements, right, based on the physiology and their labs. So the question is, why is this happening? So it turns out if you, it, the answer is pretty intuitive. If you look at the, what supervised learning is doing, they're effectively, so in this, let's consider, go back to this example. So at, with star, I've marked a patient when they died. Okay, and the first 24-hour period. And now in the period between the time when you're making the prediction and when they died, all sorts of other events are happening. An example event could be a surgery or some other kind of intervention which is independently high risk. And when this intervention happens, it tends to increase the risk of mortality, right? So when you're trying to forecast on day after the first 24 hours, you have no idea what fraction of your patients are going through this. You're effectively learning a model that learns the average risk in your population, right? So you're averaging across your population to understand average risk given a certain expectation of patients that happen to go through this procedure, right? Now, the challenge with this is if you go to hospital A versus hospital B, or even in hospital A, as practice patterns change, or the people coming in change, or the way people prescribe change, effectively your risk scores are going to change because suddenly you're capturing, you're wanting to forecast, given what I've seen thus far, what is the risk, but in essence you're really marginalizing over this unsaid variable that you've never really quantified, which is these other variables that increase risk. So this is an issue any time you're looking to do these kinds of forecasting with temporal data, okay? And so at a high level, this kind of can be thought of as this notion of, you know, just a mnemonic that's easy to remember called policy creep, which is you have policy-dependent relationships between variables, in this case the fact that somebody got a surgery, and these relationships do not generalize when policies change. And you really want risk scores that are invariant to these changes. So in this example, how do we counter that? Well, 
here's what I'm going to contend. So on top is the model we tend to train, which is a conditional distribution, right? Which is Y of S, Y is your outcome, which is risk of mortality. H of T is history. So what you're doing right now is training a conditional model, which is Y given history, okay? What you really want to be doing, instead of training a conditional model, which is Y mortality in the future given history, which is the first 24 hours, you want to actually control for what is happening between the time at which you're predicting and mortality. In other words, you want to control for the specific choice of interventions that are happening in this period, right? And when you do that, you're effectively doing this notion of what's called counterfactual reasoning, which is this notion of I want to predict what the why would have been had there been no interventions or had there been a specific set of interventions. So effectively, the, this, this notation here signifies the fact that you have a regime. You're explicitly asking what is the risk both given history and a specific choice of regime. And by doing this, what you're explicitly doing is controlling for the unknowns. You're controlling for the fact that you're explicitly deciding what do you want to marginalize over or under what regime are you actually measuring risk, right? So contention here is this is a much more well-formulated question and one that is the one we should be asking instead of asking the question that results in average risk. And that particular version, the average risk, is much more susceptible to the specific choice of the training data set you're using. So because of time, I won't get to dive into the details of um, how we explicitly uh, train these models, but um, this is a NIPS paper that came out in 2017, and the paper goes both reviews other work for training counterfactual models from temporal data, it also reviews and proposes specific models for counterfactual, called the counterfactual Gaussian processes for training models from sparse, irregularly sampled time series data that explicitly fits that objective I just gave you. And let me do a quick simulated data example to show you why this is useful. So in this particular example, I'm showing you history. That's the box in red. I want to predict a person's risk trajectory. And we're going to draw two versions of the risk trajectory. The one on top is the one from the counterfactual model. The one from the bottom is the one from the supervised learning algorithm, which is training a conditional distribution without controlling for the uh, specific regime. And here, in this particular case, I did simulated data. And, on, and what I'm showing you is the following. I generated two different data sets, regime A and regime B. And I'm testing. So I train the model in regime A. I train a second model in regime B. But I'm going to test both models on the test data simulated from regime. And what I want you to notice is the following. Effectively, I'm computing the predicted risk trajectory, and I'm going to measure the degree to which my predicted risk trajectory flip-flops as I move from regime A to regime B. Ideally, the risk should be a fraction uh, property of the patient's measurements and not the choice of the specific data set you're using. In this case, as a result, we should not expect any flip-flopping. But what it turns out is that um, when we train in regime A versus regime B, the, the supervised learning, the, the CGP, which is the counterfactual model, if you see the difference in the, it's, uh, the this is not ideal. OK, so the counterfactual model actually sees um, you see that the difference between regime A and regime B is practically 0.0, .0 very little, versus the one uh, from the supervised learning model, which is the baseline GP, is something like, is, is much bigger. So in other words, the trajectories are flip-flopping. And further, as a result, the rank ordering of the patients are flip-flopping, which basically means you would be making totally different care decisions based on this idiosyncratic dependency that happens to be in your data. Okay, so key takeaways. Um, here in this case, a subtle issue that comes up as we train models from these data, as we move away from applications like face detection and more into applications in healthcare where reliability is very important, um, these notions of how, what are the right training objectives to be using. And in particular, I'm advocating here for this notion of controlling for the regime, over, uh, controlling for the regime in which you're making a prediction when doing these risk prediction models. And I spoke about this only in the uh, context of healthcare, but the ideas are broadly applicable for any decision support applications you're training when, treating, uh, when uh, learning from temporal data.
Okay, so I see that I have only two minutes left, so I'm going to go very fast. So um, in this particular case, uh, so okay, so in order to take this to practice, basically these are the three effective steps. You start from, you build the model. Model diagnostics is actually super important. So do you have accurate and reliable estimates? The more you do diagnosis, the more you discover these issues. That then turns into new innovations. That then turns into a better, uh, better model. And then are you measuring the right metric? Are you using the right metrics to measure performance? Next piece is actionability, which is once you have a model, who's going to use it? How are they going to use it, right? That allows you to frame the problem differently, and this whole thing progresses in a loop until you get to a happy place where you have your users using it. In this particular case, doctors using this application in order to make risk assessments. So I'm actually going to skip this. We've uh, taken this work and made this and other innovations to apply to this life-threatening disease called sepsis. I'm going to unfortunately skip that in the interest of time and end with um, some challenges, some new and exciting challenges that this area opens up. So one, kind of going beyond just model fitting alone to thinking about are you framing the right problems? Robustness in the face of unexpected scenarios. So as new scenarios happen because you're in dynamical settings, are your model, is your model robust to these scenarios? Three. Gold standard data are often expensive. In fact, in many cases, they don't exist at all. So model validation alone is a challenging issue, and it's important to get it right. So thinking through multiple ways to either triangulate or using diverse sources of supervision is a very exciting uh, area for that needs much more work. Um, fourth, as we're in incorporating many, many different types of sensory data, each with different sources of bias and different sources of noise, this notion of can we, can we in some way get a calibrated notion of uncertainty that then allows us to know when to act and when not to act. And then finally, um, new opportunities for building, you know, as we move closer to augmentation, new opportunities for building uh, human-machine collaborative systems. Uh, with that, uh, for those of you who are interested in learning more, um, a few years ago I wrote this article called A Three Trillion Dollar Challenge to Computational Scientists in a very layperson way. It reviews no uh, different application areas in healthcare where novel data sources are arising and there's opportunity to make an impact. There's also two tutorials I point to that I gave recently. In particular, I want to draw your attention to the UAI tutorial where we speak at length about the work at the intersection of machine learning and counterfactual reasoning in order to be able to make uh, assessments from this kind of electronic health record data. And with that, thank you. Taking, uh, while we're taking questions, could the next uh, speaker please come to the front to get set up? Yes. Hi. Uh, I was wondering why you didn't use a survival analysis model for your second case, because oh. uh, that would explicitly take into account the sensory of the data. It seems to fit precisely the, the use case that you had. Actually, that's a great question. We do. Uh, the slides I s skipped are exactly the slides that discuss this notion of I cast it using supervised learning just because more people are familiar with it. Uh, but in reality, you want to... So let me answer that in two steps. So one is the notion of choosing a binary classification objective versus a time-to-event objective. For the example problem, time-to-event is more natural, and that's exactly what we use. Uh, and the challenge there is kind of training time to event from hundreds of sensor signals and doing joint estimation. And that's something I didn't get to talk about. Independent of that is this notion of regardless of whichever choice of method you use, you're still trying to do forecasting. And as soon as you're doing forecasting, at the time at which you're doing forecasting to the event time, there's this notion of confounding that happens because of interventions. And that's the version that I spoke about in this very simple setting of two class classification. Hi. Um, I, I have a question. So it seems that this uh, score to measure the, how the severity of the disease is essentially trained to separate uh, before taking the medication and after taking the medication. Do you have evidence that this is a good way to measure progression of the disease across a long term for a single patient? Because it doesn't seem that the loss has an incentive to do this. 
and the plots were kind of roughly constant over time, while we would expect that the, the, the disease progresses as time goes by. Yeah, so we added constraints also that did this thing where if a person was in stage one versus somebody who was in stage three, or if we knew they were in stage one in one period and stage three in another period, you can take two tests and add constraints related to that, and that would take care of this. Having said this, you're right that it is actually quite hard, like we can creatively add these constraints in order to train our data. Obviously, depending on the number of constraints you add and the parameters you choose, you're gonna get different answers. And now the question remains, how do we think through the degree to which this sensitivity to the choice of answers matters, right? So at a very coarse level, you can kind of get fluctuations and you can get progression. And now the question is, well, how sensitive are these? And I think that remains an open question and something that I think will be increasingly important, especially as we start incorporating these in trials. Thanks. Hello, um, it's a great talk. I, I have a cure, so uh, for, for neurodegeneration, uh, or forecasting, you can collect a lot of data. So like imaging, sequencing, mass spec. Uh, and I'm curious if you think that uh, deep learned models will do well in terms of predicting um, you know, a patient's risk. And if it does well, there's also this concern of uh, interpretability in the models. And I know that you mentioned uncertainty, right? How do you calibrate uncertainty? And what if all of a sudden in a test example, we see something that's a patient profile that's very, very different from what we've trained on. Um, I know there are methods that are starting to allow us to interpret deep learning models, such as you know, Bayesian uh, deep learning to, to get to regress on the variance. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on in terms of the state of those uncertainty methods and whether or not they're good enough to be applied in practice. Great question. So, um, okay, so I'll answer that in parts. Um, so at the highest level, here's kind of my first take on it. Healthcare data is so hard, and getting things right is so important. And there are so many new sources of bias that we have not been exposed to when we think through traditional applications of machine learning and say, imaging or text data. When we're trying to combine these various sources, this notion of a gold standard is not obvious. So what I found in my experience in being, uh, you know, working on different applications at this uh, intersection and kind of working through what I really need, what machine learning do I really need to invent. For me, the majority of the challenge has been more on kind of formulating the right objective, understanding are we adjusting for the right sources of bias. How do we build methods that allow you to adjust for these sources of bias? How do you build methods that account for uncertainty as you're integrating these diverse data sources? How do you take advantage of these weak supervision sources the choice of specific nonlinear function approximators I use has been much lower down the stack in the set of things I absolutely think we need. So it, I agree with you that I think as we collect more data and we're kind of at the point where we've got a lot of these other things right, then adding a rich function approximator is a really good idea. But I'm extraordinarily worried about starting from that rich function approximator as my top need without understanding the rest of the stack. And it's extraordinarily hard. If I can't debug it, I don't understand if I'm getting the predictors right, the, valid, the source of bias right, if it's uh, idiosyncratically responding to noise or perturbation sources in the environment that I don't expect it to. I'm extraordinarily worried about building a castle. Um, a, yeah, new glass castle. Okay, let's uh, thank our speaker. Thank you so much.